Uh, welcome to this uh, webinar on the digital media in a crisis, rethinking their role and function. Uh, this is a webinar uh, organized in partnership uh, between the Academia Europea Cardiff Hub, the University of Bremen, Cardiff University, and SAPEA Science Advice for Policy by European Academies. Before we get any further, uh, let me say a few words about Academia Europea and SAPEA. Next slide, please. Next slide, please, Phil. Thank you. So uh, the most visible role for Academia Europea is its participation in the European Commission's scientific advice mechanism, which provides independent science advice to European commissioners to inform their decision making. As I said, SAPEA stands for Science Advice for Policy by European Academies and is delivered by five pan-European networks, Academia Europea, ALEA, All European Academies, Eurocase, the Federation of European Engineering Academies, ESAC, Science Advisory Council for European Academies, and FEAM, the Federation of European Medical Academies. It started operating in 2017 early, and the main role is to produce evidence review reports in areas in which the European commissioners uh, ask for advice. And I've just shown here three examples of evidence review reports in SAPEA that were actually masterminded by Academia Europea. The one in the middle, Making Sense of Science, was actually chaired by Ortwin Wren, who is one of our panelists today. Next slide, please. So in our webinar today, we have a number of speakers. Uh, we have four main speakers, which are in the upper row on this slide. Uh, Andreas Hepp from the University of Bremen, uh, Karin Wald Jorgensen from Cardiff University, Ortwin Wren, Director of the Institute for Advanced Sustainability Studies in Potsdam, Berlin, and Dr. Nicholas Clifton from Cardiff University. But before we get on to the real theme of the webinar, we have a number of uh, sort of introductions because it's a special event celebrating the cooperation between uh, Uni Bremen and Cardiff University. And so we have a few remarks from uh, Vice Presidents International from Cardiff University, uh, Professor Rudolf Ellerman, and Vice President International from uh, University of Bremen, uh, Professor Eva Maria Feichner. And because this is also part of the Wales in Germany series, uh, we are uh, pleased to have uh, Peter Halligan, the Chief Scientific Advisor to the Welsh Government uh, with us today, who will also say a few words about Wales and Germany. And finally, just uh, two uh, practical remarks. Uh, last slide, please. Last slide, please, Phil. No, the last, yeah, thank you. So please use the Q&A button exclusively to ask questions. We will go through the presentations without any interruption, and then we will have hopefully half an hour for discussion at the end. And use the Q&A button to type in your questions, make them concise, because that's by far the best chance of getting your uh, question chosen. Sometimes people have a long essay and that's not really helpful in this uh, situation. And you were already have seen that the webinar is being recorded. So without further ado, I would now like to uh, give the floor to Professor Rudolf Allemann, uh, Vice President International at Cardiff University. So Rudy, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Ole. Prananda Ekroeso, good afternoon, everyone. On behalf of Cardiff University, it is my very great pleasure to welcome you all to the digital webinar on digital media in crisis situations. I'm really delighted that Cardiff University, together with the Academia Europea Hub and our partner university in Bremen, are hosting this event. We are proud to be the host university for the Academia Europea Cardiff Hub. We at Cardiff and other UK universities benefit greatly from the high quality work of the academia in promoting the use of scientific advice for European policymaking, a function that I think is all the more important now that the UK has left the European community. This month also is, this, is the strategic partnership between Bremen and Cardiff, the two universities, is in its second year. Today is the, is the second anniversary of this. So it is really very timely for us to run this joint event today. 
Education and research in the area of journalism and media have been one of the key focus areas for a partnership right from the beginning. It is very rewarding to be able to share some of the excellent work of our ac academics in the context of a partnership. I'm particularly pleased that we can share their work, not just between uh, Wales and Germany, but with a wider international audience through this webinar. I would also just like quickly to take the opportunity to thank the Welsh Government for their support in promoting today's webinar. It is part of the extensive programmes of events taking place across Wales today to, uh, to celebrate St David's Day. Many of you will know that St David is the patron saint of Wales. Wales in Germany, Ole has mentioned it, is a theme for the internalization agenda of the Welsh Government for 2021. And I hope that in spite of the COVID restrictions that we all suffer from, we will be able to do much more to promote the relationship between our two nations this year and well into the future. So having said that, and without further ado, on behalf of Cardiff University, again, let me welcome you very much to this event and I look forward to what promises to be a very exciting webinar this afternoon. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Ruiti. And now uh, I'm very happy to give the floor to Professor Eva Maria Feichner. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Also from the side of uh, Bremen University, I would, I would uh, like to extend a warm welcome to everybody around. We're very uh, glad to be co-organizing this year together with the Academia Europea Cardiff Knowledge Hub. We very much enjoyed the, the collaboration and the, uh, the, uh, the working together that, that brought us here. In fact, as uh, Rudy Allemann already mentioned, it is, or uh, we signed our strategic partnership with uh, Cardiff University just about two years ago. So this, in fact, today is the first public appearance of the Bremen Cardiff Alliance outside our own premises, is something which like premises exist still these days. Um, scholars on both ends have worked really hard during these two years to get especially research collaboration in our four fo focus areas from the ground. And one of them will have the floor today, the, the media science, and we'll, we'll see colleagues from, from both ends. So uh, COVID-19 has cut a lot of possibilities also for this young alliance. Uh, personal visits uh, were, were brought to a full stop about a year ago. And we all know that, especially in the period of building up an alliance, it's very crucial to have this, this personal interaction. But also COVID-19 has opened up opportunities. Only two years ago, we wouldn't have dreamed about reaching such a large audience online as we do today, as we do every day almost uh, in, in these days. So when we focus today on times of crisis, I guess we also focus on the, on the opportunities and uh, on how we would possibly extract the best of what we learned and bring it over to the new, norm uh, to the new uh, normal. Allow me to look ahead a few months. Uh, as uh, Rudy mentioned, we are in the uh, Welsh of Germany, uh, uh, Wales in Germany 2021 uh, initiative, and we'll hope to see uh, the, um, the Bremen uh, Cardiff partnership intertwine yet, yet another time in this, in this vein. We are planning in Bremen a Cardiff week in the end of the year, in November. We hope to welcome many, many guests then if uh, things, uh, things are a little bit more back to normal. This will be an opportunity to showcase yet another time our, our research collaboration. There will be uh, cultural events. There's going to be concert of Welsh music. There's going to be literature reading. So we hope to get a glimpse of that normal uh, by the end, by the end of the year. With that, I'm very much looking forward to the uh, discussion today, and I hand back to uh, Ole Pedersen. Okay, thank you very much, Eva Maria. And now uh, we have a few words from uh, Peter Halligan, the Welsh Government's Chief Scientific Advisor. Peter, the floor is yours. Thank you, Ole, and uh, happy St. David's Day. Delighted to be with you as part of this wider Welsh Government programme of events for Wales and Germany 21. Although I'm not able to join the wider discussion, I thought I'd briefly cover two points, two areas. The Welsh Government perspective on managing the pandemic in Wales and some observations on the role of science advice and the importance of how this science advice is communicated through the media. So the last 12 months has witnessed a remarkable, unprecedented global effort to test 
treat, and ultimately vaccinate against COVID-19. Despite the horrendous loss of life and families bereaved, the destruction of businesses and livelihoods and harms to mental health, the COVID-19 pandemic has demonstrated to governments and the general public all over the world the vital role that science plays in addressing life and economic threatening challenges, but also the critical role that science advice plays for informing government decisions. Within a year and against most expectations, scientists isolated the virus, monitored its spread and came up with several effective vaccines and treatments. Science, scientists, science advice and science media have been changed by the COVID crisis. Never before have science professionals been more in the public eye. In many countries, scientific experts have become national spokespersons, expected not only to provide scientific evidence, but also to justify policy actions, which in many cases are not solely evidenced. Sir Paul Nurse has described the pandemic as an opportune Apollo moment for increasing the visibility, importance and appeal of science, with chief scientific advisors on TV, with prime ministers in press briefings and on the social media. However, given the requirement for transparency and compliance with government policies, many of these are dependent on individual choice and therefore scientists were no longer providing advice exclusively to government, but for the different forms of media and for the less informed and often skeptical general public. What I'd like to do now is just share you some little insights on the Welsh government perspective on the pandemic. So I'm going to just try and go over to my screen and put up one or two slides. Can and if I can do in slideshow. Okay, so an extraordinary year by any uh, measurement. The way that science structures work in the United Kingdom, for those not familiar, there's the UK government that is a centralizing source, but the devolved administrations have responsibility for public health. And therefore, with regard to that the uh, pandemic was an opportunity to demonstrate the cross linkages and some of the challenges between the UK government, which goes through the Prime Minister's COBRA team, the UK Chief Medical Officer and Scientific Advisor, and through SAGE, the main body of informational exchange. But the various devolved nations feed into those particular um, conduits. And from that point of view, the Chief Medical Officers and some of the Chief Scientific Advisors for Health we're working together collectively over the last 12 months. In Wales, we set up a technical advisory cell and a technical advisory group. I'll describe them in a little bit more detail. But basically these provided for the provision of regular, sometimes daily briefings by the first minister or the minister for health, by our two um, lead experts, and that is Dr. Frank Atherton, the chief medical officer, and Dr. Rob Alford, who's the Chief Scientific Advisor for Health. And they played a pivotal role in engaging a wide range of medical, public, social science scientists across Welsh universities in providing valued science advice to the Welsh Government. They also had to uh, provide reports, and the, the example of this is on the right-hand side, technical reports describing the basis for that evidence to justify that. Now, the technical advisory group are, uh, is the wider group that comprises uh, university experts and, and, and industry experts and so forth. The advisory cell is the core group of civil servants that were actually driving this. And they were responsible for interacting with SAGE, the, the rapid evaluation and synthesis and production of scientific information, and deriving and producing drafts for wider uh, sectorial communication. They met every week, sometimes they met two times a week, as it were, and they were central for, for providing the Welsh Government and by extension then into SAGE information that came from Wales. It's required a huge amount of work, much greater than had ever been expected. Now I'm going to stop sharing on that because that just gives you a, a brief description of what went on. I'm going to just finish by giving you a couple of observations on this. Science advice in an emergency is quite different to the usual type pace and media attention given to science advice. The length of the pandemic has placed exceptional demands on the people and organizations contributing their expertise uh, and the very structures that were designed for a much shorter term emergencies. Going forward, all governments will need to consider how to support the resilience of the arrangements of science advice for longer term operation as we move from pandemic into endemic. 
In the pandemic, the important question and challenge remains how scientists working with policymakers can effectively join together to develop and implement policies of the greatest likelihood of limiting mortality and severe economic challenge. All of this has to be done in a situation where the evidence is uncertain and rapidly evolving. So no matter what the evidence base, the policies selected need to be understood and be adopted by the general public as well, which means that those providing the evidence need to be trusted. This is challenging as the scientific evidence base informing the policy responses to COVID-19 were often incomplete and conditional as much more data is collected, the scientific understanding of COVID-19 changed. In such a dynamic time constrained situation where policymakers and the public want assurance and certainty, there's a real challenge for the scientific community as consensus is difficult to achieve, yet communication of uncertainties and alternative views can potentially undermine trust in scientific advice and related policies. And finally, in terms of communication with the public, which in some respects is one of the bases of, of today's set webinar, no matter how good the scientific advice and how well it is integrated into crisis management and decision-making process, the way that it is communicated to the public has major impact on its effectiveness. Communication of scientific insights and to the general public is more than ever now part of the task of science advisors. This has been very much the case as regards COVID, where the performance of different political, medical and scientific leaders has been closely scrutinized, variously criticized. In the public health crisis, such as we are, the public need to understand the rationale be behind policy measures and have confidence in the government's approach. Scientific advisors more than ever need to be skilled communicators able to transmit their findings, both to policymakers and the wider public to deal with fake facts. I'm going to finish on that particularly because I know there's lots more uh, to contribute today. So thank you very much for the ability to contribute today. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Peter. So that concludes the introductions and we now move on to the theme of today's uh, webinar. And uh, I'm very uh, pleased to now give the floor to Professor Andreas Hepp from the uh, University of Brightman. Uh, so Andreas, the floor, the virtual floor is yours. Okay, well, thank you very much. Thanks a lot for the introduction and the possibility to speak uh, here uh, on this online event. So what, what I want to do in these five, five minutes I have is to highlight one thought, and this is the thought that we experience nowadays a crisis like COVID-19 as a deeply mediatized crisis. And this means, means much more than just a coverage about a crisis. So there are four points I want to highlight with that. The first point uh, in relation to this basic thesis I have is uh, mediatized expectations. The second is mediatized experiences. The third is mediatized analysis. And the fourth is mediatized solutions. So across uh, the way how we experienced uh, COVID-19, it was a phenomenon of mediatization. Let's start with mediatized expectations. So before even COVID-19 started, we all had in mind various, various kinds of scenarios, how such a pandemic might appear or how we might appear such a pandemic. It is through films, through theories, through computer games in which we learned long years before uh, the pandemic happened what to do or what not to do, at least as imaginations. And for the ones who did not use these kinds of media, they had a chance from the first time of con uh, COVID-19 onward because they were available across all platforms. So already our expectations of a pandemic like that are mediatized. Second point, is the mediatized experience of a pandemic like this. So here you can relate to what is called media coverage, which was a particular kind of media coverage when it comes to COVID-19. Very much a coverage, for example, through data journalism, presenting us continuously the latest uh, statistics about infected people, about death, about vaccinations at this moment of time. So it was really a coverage of statistics in real time, very often with uh, not a real deep analysis of these statistics. It was an automatic production of these statistics. Uh, 
and very often accompanied by social media with all the rumors you find in social media. But the crucial point is that it was a mediatized or is still a mediatized experience of the pandemic. Second, or sorry, third point is the point of mediatized analysis. So many parts of how the pandemic was continuously analyzed, at least from a social science point of view, was by the help of data and very often data which was generated by digital media and digital media infrastructure. So think about, for example, even the public discussion, how people behave during times of lockdown. The data on which this discussion was grounded was data on the basis of analysis of mobile phones, lock-ins, and comparable kinds of data. We also, or we have in that sense, or have in that sense, a continuous mediatized analysis during the pandemic. And the fourth point I want to highlight here is the point of mediatized solutions. So I think one way of mediatized solution we experience at this moment of time, having here a Zoom event, but also at various other kinds, uh, we were confronted with the imagination that media, digital media and infrastructures might be a solution of the pandemic situation. Think about, for example, how home office was realized, or think about the so-called COVID-19 apps and also their failure. And I think this is an interesting point, especially the failure of digital media, because you here you again realize uh, the role of expectations. So we are framed in the way how we imagine that digital media might be a solution by all the narrations which come from Silicon Valley, and maybe partly Silicon Valley and the tech industry there is or are the companies who make the big income out of COVID-19. And the crisis is rather experienced by the people and by the regional governments. So these were the four points I wanted to highlight here. The crucial thesis or the crucial argument, the core argument is that we can understand a pandemic or a crisis nowadays only as something that is deeply mediatized. Well, thank you very much, Andreas, for these remarks. Uh, it was a very helpful start to the, to the webinar. And we move on now uh, without uh, delay to the second uh, talk, which will be given by Professor Karin Val Jorgensen from uh, Cardiff University. So uh, Karin, uh, please uh, take the floor. Prananda, a deep wheel, there we have this. Good afternoon and happy St. David's Day. Um, I want to build on what um, Andreas has just talked about, uh, focusing on what is distinctive about this crisis in terms of media and the particularly vital role played by community and local media. So, first of all, I want to make the point that the coronavirus pandemic marks a very distinctive historical moment in terms of the circulation of information. It's the first major global crisis that plays out not just in and through mainstream media, but also through social media like Twitter and Facebook. We're living in what the political communication scholar Andrew Chadwick has talked about as a hybrid media system where content from traditional media interacts with what is shared on social media. In the coronavirus pandemic, the World Health Organization has warned of an infodemic, suggesting that both accurate and inaccurate information is, is rapidly and kind of virally spreading in the ongoing crisis. And research indeed has shown that social media have allowed for an unprecedented dissemination of conspiracy theories. You've probably all heard about them, but for instance, they include the idea that the coronavirus is a hoax or alternatively that it was engineered in a lab and orchestrated by figures like Bill Gates and George Soros. And with the ramping up of vaccination campaigns, there's growing concerns that misinformation is going to lead to vaccine hesitancy. So for example, these conspiracy theories around vaccines advance ideas that getting a jab might alter your DNA or implant microchips in your body to give just a few examples. This is obviously very dangerous because misinformation of this kind undermines trust in institutions, a trust which is already fragile 
um, at a time when trusting um, institutions and authorities is really essential. So against this very challenging backdrop, my research has particularly focused on the role of community journalism, or what is sometimes called hyperlocal journalism. And community journalism outlets are these small, uh, independently owned print or online publications which represent a specific geographic area and publish locally relevant news and community focused content. Most of these publications that I've studied have emerged over the past decade as new platforms like WordPress, for example, have made it easier for people to launch publications with very limited entry costs. I've taken an interest in these outlets in a context where the provision of local news is in very severe crisis. What we've seen in most Western democracies is that once thriving local and regional newspapers have closed shop. So in the UK, uh, more than 300 local newspapers closed down between 2005 and 2015 alone. Now, community journalism, so these hyper-local news providers, are sometimes seen as a solution to this crisis. And the research that I've done over the past year has focused on understanding the role of community journalism in the context of the pandemic. And I've done this research through interviews with 59 established community journalists between July and September 2020. I thought this research was particularly important because in the pandemic, our local areas have truly become the focal point of our activities. First of all, because of lockdowns, many of us have been restricted to staying local. Secondly, the pandemic has unfolded in highly localized ways, so understanding what is happening in our communities is vitally important. And thirdly, it is through local news that we learn about activities ranging from sing-alongs and food bank collections to localized testing and vaccination campaigns. Now, my research found that community journalists saw a huge increase in traffic to their sites over the course of the pandemic. And these journalists saw it as their responsibility to pro provide reliable and trustworthy information to their communities in a context where so much misinformation is distributed. As a result of that, several outlets published stories that corrected misinformation uh, circulating at the local level about everything ranging from hospital outbreaks uh, to miracle cures. Several outlets also started live blogs and provided up-to-date information about local cases and deaths, which was otherwise very difficult to access. So more than anything, my research found that the pandemic represented a moment of vindication for reliable information through mass media and that local media are more important than they ever have been. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Karen, uh, for this uh, very nice presentation. And we now move on to Professor Ortwin Wren, who, as I mentioned, actually chaired the uh, working group for one of our most important evidence review reports in SAPIR, the Making Sense of Science, a topic that obviously is very relevant to our current crisis situation. So, Ortwin, please, the floor is yours. Well, thank you very much, Ola. And I would like to raise uh, five points, and those are all in relation to the effect of social and natural science on the media and vice versa. So the first point that I would like to make, and that's almost obvious, we can see that the social media provide opportunities for good science communication, but also has a lot of risks for bad science communication. So both are happening at the same time. And what we can see in contrast to the conventional media is that social medias are amplifiers for both good and bad communication. My second point is that among the many opportunities that we have also as scientists is that we now have direct access to the final consumers. In the old days, basically scientists had only contact to journalists and then they were up to their ability and capacity to work with what the scientists were saying and then developed some kind of communication. Definitely we had brochures or other ways of direct communication, but they were limited. Now we can see that a lot of very good scientists have their direct social media channels 
And specifically in the pandemic now, we can see that a lot of fairly <coughs> high esteemed scientists, specifically from the medical field, virology, have now their channels in which they communicate directly to the people. And that I think is a, a great advantage over the mediated approach that we had before. Now, turning it to the risks, I think uh, what we see in these post-factual times is that most people have a very hard time to distinguish between truth claims. That means they don't have the right criteria or the right benchmark to decide or to demarcate the line between nonsense and sense. And nonsense comes in the disguise of a lot of sense and that makes it very difficult for people to decipher what is right and what is wrong. And uh, since the world has become so complex and we have so many truth claims on the social media that are just not controlled by anyone, uh, many people now select the truth claims by using the criterion of, uh, I would say, um, um, what is uh, for them desirable. And uh, so it's not the unconvenient truth, uh, as I've seen in a very famous book, but it's the convenient truth. So what seems to be convenient is truthful. And that, of course, is an invitation to disaster. And that leads me to my fourth point, that we get more and more echo chambers in which convenient truths are being shared for people who believe in these convenient truths and totally reinforced so that everybody finds enough support for whatever kind of absurd claim uh, it's being um, postulated. And that, of course, is a problem for democracy, particularly uh, and also for science communication, because people are so convinced about what they hear in their own echo chamber that they're not open for any kind of counter evidence. And even the most absurd things can become very tr truthful convictions because everyone in the same chamber shares them. So my last point is what is then the role of science and what is the role of scientists? Number one is I think we should take more uh, part in the social media platforms, meaning that scientists should be part of the ones that actually use the media in order to make sure that whatever they have to say in terms of messages are at least communicated to those who listen. We know that between the years of 20, uh, 15 years old and 35 year old social media have not become the main point of uh, information or the main source of information. So having scientists all to be part of the social media circus, I know for them, many that's difficult to do, but for many it's not. So I think we also need a reward system that rewards scientists for using these kind of channels. The second point I think it's very important since we live more in a visual world, it's very important to have the real truth claims well visualized. And it's not just visualized in terms of pictures, but also in terms of good analogies or the modern term for this is very convincing narratives. We need better narratives that can help science to communicate a good story, a good message to everyone, which seems plausible and which also has all the characteristics for people to remember them and to say, oh, that is really you know, um, plausible for me. The third thing I think what's very important is that you get people involved in these kind of decision-making processes also now in the coronavirus uh, crisis. We see in some states and we have actually um, studied that where citizens and uh, stakeholder groups were invited to also deliberate about the measures, the measures had much more compliance. So compliance is not only dependent on plausibility, but also on empowerment. And so I think both is very important to have a very good enlightened way of communicating, but also to communicate, to empower people to be part of the decision-making system so that they gain ownership also over the various uh, uh, measures that the government is advocating or even prescribing. 
And my last point, I think it's uh, one that now we're living right in the middle of the crisis and we see we have not been well prepared for this crisis. So we need to anticipate crisis much better in the future so that if one of these crises happens like a pandemic, we have a risk communication and a crisis communication team ready based on very good interdisciplinary science that can operate immediately. At least for the countries that I come from, Germany, it took quite a while before we had a kind of interdisciplinary group of people that would advise the government, would advise the public, and have a good interdisciplinary composition. Next time, we should have that in the beginning. And I think that it would also have more success in making whatever we do more effective. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Audwin, for these uh, very uh, good and important thoughts. And we now come to the last but not the least important presentation, namely from uh, Nicholas uh, Clifton. So uh, please uh, start your talk now, Nicholas. Thank you, and uh, hello and good afternoon. So I'd like to introduce you to a new online tool that provides this link between uh, scientists and the public. And it's a very new tool only been developed within the past uh, six months. I'm gonna share a few slides to illustrate how it works. Okay, so this tool is called Authentici and it was developed uh, during one of these Lindau Nobel laureate meetings um, and its development has continued to be stimulated by the Lindau Nobel laureate meetings group um, along with an international group of early career scientists. This, uh, Lin these Lin Lindau Nobel laureate meetings are organized every year in, in Germany and um, and what happens is a few hundred early career researchers meet up with about 40 to 50 Nobel laureates each year and um, and it promotes the interaction between those groups and, and tries to stimulate uh, new ideas. So this is the team um, involved in the development of Authentici. Um, and it was uh, very much our view that it's the responsibility of scientists to restore the trust in science that's perhaps lacking um, due to the uh, what we call a, a post-factual era. And um, this project was put forward to a competition um, and we, we were awarded finalists as part of the Nobel laureate meeting. So if this is a very simple view of the communication of science um, from the scientists, their research over to the, the general public and the readers, um, firstly, um, you will see that there's you know, a, a big distance from the scientists to the, to the readers, but um, but hopefully we can improve this by allowing uh, a feedback from the scientists on the validity of science journalism and science media articles to the general public. And this is where Authentici comes in at this step. The tool is a uh, online web browser extension, which you would uh, download from uh, Firefox or the, or the Chrome store or otherwise. And, um, and by clicking the extension, readers can view the scores attributed to the validity of that media article is provided by scientists, and it will show you the number of scientists who provide that score. And there's also a breakdown of um, various other categories based on the sources, the, the clarity of the information, and also the extent of bias. And what happens is the uh, scientists are able to log in and, um, and provide reviews of the media which uh, these reviews are then stored in a database that, that the readers can access through their web browser extension. Now, scientists have to be authenticated using their ORCID ID. Um, this is a method where um, uh, scientists will link their um, publications and their patents to themselves um, through this identifier. And this also links to, to the institution as, as well. And it adds, as a, it adds a layer of confidence to the reliability of the scores that are being provided through this tool. Um, and at the moment, these um, the scores are provided through um, a website, although um, we're, we're developing this further so that the scores can be provided directly through the extension. And you use various inf um, questions to, to, to guide your score. And finally, 
as we've already seen, the public will then view those scores using the extension. Okay, um, so that's um, that's me and um, the the main strengths of this tool is that the, the data is very much crowdsourced. There are other tools out there that um, that will have some extent of bias, um, but this this we hope has uh, strength in its in its nature of being crowdsourced by many scientists and and the lack of commitment required by those scientists to do so. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much indeed, uh, Nicholas, for this uh, quite interesting tool which no doubt uh, people will want to discuss. So uh, thank you very much for all of you for keeping the time and uh, perhaps please make yourself visible again so that the panel can be uh, seen as it were <laughs> in its entirety and uh, be ready for, 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 for this discussion. So, uh, just to get the ball rolling, uh, maybe I can sort of uh, ask a perhaps a little bit a provocative question to start with. And my question is actually to uh, Ortwin. So, you somehow made the point that initially, somehow, Germany was not media ready and it took a bit of time, but now somehow things uh, have improved. Uh, from my admittedly quite superficial uh, reading of German newspapers uh, online, it seems to me that uh, in many ways the situation in Germany has worsened recently. I see uh, very vicious attacks on the German government almost every day from several uh, newspapers which seemed to me somewhat unfair, actually. It's even so extreme now that I have seen uh, congratulations to Britain from various uh, German newspapers, in spite of the fact that the death rate per population in, in, in Britain is twice as high as, as it is in Germany, and, and still is higher than in Germany, actually. So it seems that this enormous criticism of the German government going through the media, at least through the newspapers, seems uh, highly unfair, and also probably not very uh, helpful in terms of the vaccination program. So I just wonder what has happened there. So yes, it may be that the media have become more engaged, but have they become more engaged in a helpful manner? And if not, why, why is this happening? Yeah, thank you very much, Ola. I think that's a very important, interesting question. I think here, yeah, you know, they're not clear answers to this question because sometimes those things happen and we're not totally sure what are the main causes. If you ask for my own opinion, I think in the first wave, Germany was extremely successful in terms of trying to um, be first uh, very well prepared in the health system. So we had already a much better prepared health system from the beginning. There was never a shortage in terms of uh, hospital beds and everything else. Uh, also, there was a fairly good uh, policy in terms of making the necessary um, measures and people were fairly compliant. So everybody was seeing Germany is a kind of role model in Europe, uh, maybe different from let's say South Korea or Taiwan, which were much better role models as a matter of fact. But within Europe and maybe even with the United States or South America as a comparison, this was the, the good guy. And now over the summer, people became less more reluctant, complacent. And then, you know, what we can also see in Germany is we have a federal system, which has also very good advantages. But in the end, when it turned out in the end of September, October, that the things got worse again, I think people were more complacent at the first thing. But secondly, all the various states in Germany had their own kind of policy, which was partially related to the coronavirus, but also partially related to upcoming elections. And, and then the third thing I think what happened was that, you know, there was a lot of promises in terms of fast vaccination. So they were saying, well, within six months, we're going to have most of the people vaccinated. Now, three months are basically over, more or less, and we are, you know, less than whatever, 4% at this point. And so this is, you know, also a sign that things don't work as well as, as people had assumed. And then if you start up with big promises, with a very excellent performance, and then suddenly the performance breaks down, 
Well, you can see that the criticism is really very, very high. And the thing in the UK was the opposite. There was a lot of criticism at the beginning, specifically of downplaying the disease uh, and then, you know, not being really effective in the beginning. And now it thinks that UK gets its act together, the vaccination rate are high. So now the press is more positive. And so I think it's really just the opposite in Germany. They did very, very well in the beginning. And now, you know, they still make things fairly well compared to many others, but not as good as maybe the politicians themselves had said they would do it, but also probably also uh, worse than people expected it to be. And then um, I think the German media can be really nasty if they believe you're not doing what you're supposed to do. Uh, Andreas, I think you uh, may have a comment here. Well, well, yeah, maybe I don't, I have a really a Different, sorry, different opinion on that. So first of all, the question is, what is the role of media? The role of media is really not to communicate the position of a government. The role of the media is to criticize, to reflect, to outline alternatives, yeah, to imagine what different possibilities might be. And I really think, um, I rather would frame it like this, welcome back. So it took close to one year that many, many um, outlets in Germany, if you think about print media, really understood again that they also have a critical role. For months, they have been on the line of the government, a government uh, which framed everything which it was doing as being beyond alternatives. So this was again and again the framing. And if you look at the analysis we have of the media coverage, this was also the framing which was taken by uh, many media outlets. Now we know, of course, there have been alternatives. We can look around Europe, we can look around the world, and there have been decisions which were, which you can criticize, yeah? where you can go another way and maybe in a better way. And especially in times of social media, it's also important that legacy media, how we also call them, reflect on these critical positions and discuss them because if they don't discuss them, they will be discussed in other contexts and maybe together with some kind of fake news about myth, what's, what is going on and so on and so on. Really, I think from my point of view, of course it's hard if you're the side of the government uh, to have criticism like that. You don't feel well by this, but when it comes to what the role of media is, I rather would say, this is now awakening again of the media and um, understanding their role is also critical again. Okay, thank you. There's actually a question to you, uh, Andreas, now, uh, which I might as well take just now. So uh, the uh, Eva Lokan asks, following the hyper-mediatized experience analysis and solutions from the current pandemic, i.e. stages two to four, so to speak, of your model. How do you think it has now changed our expectations for future pandemic crises? Okay, well, I try to give, it, give a very short answer. I think we now experience it for the first time, how a crisis like that goes. And I think the next, for sure, we will be experiencing the next crisis. Um, it, no need that it is a pandemic, it can be something else. But I think it's worth to know what the dynamics are. And I think it's especially worth to be critical of understanding digital media, digital infrastructures from the beginning as a solution for everything. Yeah? So just take the example of the COVID-19 app. In many countries, the imagination which was there in the beginning and the hope that just by kind of app, you can solve something. This is just a myth. We learned over many years. It is a kind of Silicon Valley ideology. We all learned through the media. And I think being more critical against such dynamics will help us a lot for the next crisis, the next pandemic, possibly. Okay, thank you. And now there's a question which I guess could be addressed to anybody. So I'll just read it out and uh, see who would like to, uh, to answer it. So uh, Emma Brinkley says, digital media has been shown to have a detrimental effect on well-being and mental health. 
But now we are all reliant on it to stay connected with others. What will be the legacy of digital media in this pandemic? Will it have an overall positive or negative effect on our lives? And I see that Karen has her hand up. So maybe you want to start. Well, I think that, um, well, the, the most useful way of thinking about digital media is as a tool that can be used for better and for worse. So digital media and social media are not inherently uh, morally good or bad, but we can use them in particular ways. Um, and I think that what we've seen in this pandemic indeed is that um, that digital media have been used in ways that are really helpful to share information, um, to keep people informed, but also in ways that are potentially uh, unhelpful in terms of sharing conspiracy theories um, and, and fake news and, and so on. So I think that um, going forward, what's more important to pay attention to um, are the kind of social structures that create uh, the problems associated with digital media in the first place. And these are things like political uh, polarization and a decline of trust um, in, in, in institutions and societies. So, um, and, and also more broadly forms of social inequality. So until we resolve those kinds of problems, we can't necessarily point our fingers to digital media and say, digital media are bad and are responsible uh, for all the evils in the world, but rather we have to think about the broader social context. And if anything, the pandemic has really brought out the underlying inequalities in society. Uh, and that is really what has shaped um, how a lot of the communication around this pandemic has played out. Okay, thank you. And there are actually two questions to you which are linked, Karin. So one person asks, uh, does community journalism spread misinformation? And if not, why not? And uh, there's another question which basically is very, very similar, saying how does one deal with community journalism that behaves badly? So first of all, I mean, have you come across cases where community journalism has uh, reported misinformation? And if not, why is it uh, good or, or is it bad? Well, what I should say, uh, what I didn't have time to say in my uh, five minutes was that uh, the organizations that I studied are established community news organizations um, that are members of what's called the Independent Community News Network, which means that they are required to be objective, they're required to adhere to certain professional standards. And as a result of that, the people that I interviewed would not be ones who would be engaged in problematic forms of communication, but rather the ones who are most likely to pick up on that. Now, having said that, there are obviously individuals in particular communities who are systematically engaged in sharing misinformation for a variety of different purposes. But the people that I studied thought of themselves as professional journalists who are out there to do something good in the community. And, and the good thing that they're doing includes holding um, authorities to account, but also kind of um, uh, keeping an, a cl close and watchful eye on misinformation. Um, so I think it's important to establish between uh, or to distinguish between established journalistic practices and outlets, and then uh, some kind of um, a keyboard warrior who sits there spreading lots of conspiracy theories about Bill Gates and, and George Soros. These are very different kinds of activities, even though we sometimes use very similar language to describe them. Okay, uh, thank you. Now, a few more questions that have just come in. Let me just have a quick look here. Well, there's somebody who wants us, I think, to comment a bit on Facebook. He says, I wonder what your thoughts are regarding the issues with Facebook and Australia's new laws and how would this impact on the future of social media and the dissemination of news in the UK? Uh, specifically, apparently. So I don't know who would want to take that challenge up. Don't see any. Ah, oh, Karen is, uh, I mean, and Audrey also. Okay, Karen well, first. I'm, I'm not a huge expert on Facebook in Australia, but what I do know is that there's been this kind of really uneasy 
challenge in terms of Facebook and other social media um, serving as news providers and actually recognizing their role as, as news providers. And obviously, Facebook has been making um, huge amounts of money uh, by basically uh, cannibalizing content uh, from news organizations. Um, and so um, the fact that uh, this drama is currently playing out in Australia um, is um, evidence of um, the kind of unsettled role of social media um, and a relative uh, a lack of recognition that social media actually do constitute a really significant source of news for people around the world. So I think it'll be really interesting uh, to, to see how this plays out. Uh, but I think that this is, is a sort of ongoing soap opera that we're going to continue to see unfolding um, as time goes on. Okay, Otwin, you uh, also had uh, indicated that you might have something to say here. Yeah, I would only like to add, and I think I would definitely echo what Karen just said, but uh, that the big five, the five providers, big platforms are not neutral devices that are just kind of uh, stations that amplify things from a source to the final receiver. They're also very busy in selecting and also when they are commercially oriented, which they are, to see what they can take use of it and how they can also please their commercial funders. And uh, so in that sense, I think we should be, of course, always sensitive to the idea that news from these big social media outlets are also filtered for its impact for their own commercial interests. Uh, that doesn't mean it's always bad, but it's just mean that we should be aware of this. And this is also part of the story that uh, first, it, as you said, Kari, they um, take news from other sources that have, you know, had invested a lot of resources with this and then just take it over. But also that there's a strong selective bias very often in there. And that bias is not always seen to the person who consume these kinds of information. And there is a kind of supplementary to this question from uh, uh, Thomas Reuter, uh, who asks, do you have any specific recommendations for new legislation towards a more effective but proportionate regulation of social media? Mm -hmm. I don't know whether... Yeah, I, can, will continue yeah, with I just, uh, you know, just a few sentences because it really links with what I've just said. I think uh, the big five are transnational. And as long as we don't have a transnational regulatory institution that really, you know, does its effective regulatory power in a, let's say, globalized world, it will be very difficult to really regulate uh, the, um, the big five. Uh, because they can be in any country as they want to, even if they would uh, have trouble in the United States, they would still be able to go somewhere else. So in that sense, I would see that we also need more transnational institutions that help us to really deal with, uh, the, uh, with the big providers. And I think the model of uh, check and balances, which is so important for democracies, needs to have this kind of transnational component. Okay, thank you. I think that's very helpful. Uh, just now there were no more questions coming in, but I have a question. I'm not sure whether anybody uh, can fully answer it, but I think it is, uh, at least to me, it is, is, is a bit interesting. So Andreas uh, mentioned before that the real task of the media is not to propagate government uh, information or help the government manage things, but actually to criticize and highlight uh, issues and so on. So that uh, is probably uh, very correct as such. But I just thought it to be a bit provocative, ask the question, uh, what about the difference between how things have been handled also by the media in Asia and how they have been handled in Europe and, and, and the US? I don't know the answer to that at all, but it's obviously very clear as Audwin already uh, alluded to that in Asia, of course, the COVID-19 crisis has been handled very much better than in, in, in Europe and the US. I mean, this is beyond dispute uh, when you look at the number of people who have died in even 
enormous countries in Asia. I mean, they are minuscule compared to what has happened in, in, in Europe and the US. And so one wonders whether there are probably many different causes. But what about uh, media? Does anybody have any feeling for how the media have played their role in, uh, in Asia, uh, China, Japan, uh, larger countries, as compared to what has happened in Europe and US? And if we have any kind of feeling for how, how that has worked out, uh, has that played a significant role in, in, in managing the, the, the COVID-19 crisis? I don't know whether anybody is willing to challenge this. I, and, uh, I, I, and, and, and I think Andreas was first. Uh, just, no, no, uh, Karen was before me. So okay, please, okay. Well, Karen, I'll, I'll yeah. try and keep my comments brief. Um, I, I would just say that one thing uh, which we do have in, um, uh, in Europe and also to some extent in the US and, and in the UK is that we have democratic media. So that distinguishes us very clearly from the situation in China where the media are government controlled. And what that means specifically is that the media have after, as Andreas described, after a brief moment of a consensus that the media have been able to hold governments for account in, to account in situations where the handling has been inadequate. And that is, to my mind, one of the most important roles of the media to actually ensure that governments are held accountable when they're doing uh, something wrong. Uh, whereas in China, I think that the um, state-controlled media have uh, largely been uh, supporting and propping up uh, the government account of what happened in the pandemic, which also includes some misinformation um, around, around what happened. So I think it's very difficult to compare the situation in Asia, well, specifically China and in Europe and the West, uh, because of the fact that we do have well-established media institutions that are democratic and that can hold government to account. And I think that after an initial period of consensus um, and support and sort of rallying behind the flag, we have seen media holding these institutions to account. Yeah, so obviously what you say is certainly relevant uh, with regard to China. Uh, I can see that. But uh, what about Japan? Uh, what mean? Well, we had a, a, a workshop with our Japanese colleagues, also with Korean and Taiwanese, because all of them are democratic countries. Mm. And uh, one of the things, I mean, there are three things that they said uh, beyond just the media. One is, well, we are much better prepared for this. I mean, Korea had a crisis team in place when it happened, so they would do it very quickly. But secondly, we have a stronger collective mind. And so things like the apps that are much more intrusive than they are, let's say, for example, in Germany, were very well accepted by the people in Taiwan, Korea, Japan didn't have so much, but at least in the other two countries. And number three was that uh, uh, the compliance rate was much higher. Uh, and that was partially due, one, to this kind of collective mindset, but also to that uh, people felt that the government was acting in the best interest of the people. And this was one of the major correlations also in a study, a Dutch study with 64 countries. The more people were convinced that the government was actually acting uh, on behalf of the populace, acting on uh, the common good, the higher was the compliance. And, and that, I think, was a third major factor. But we also talked about the media. And basically, they said, well, the media are also very critical of Korea, about the Korean government. It was not that they were just you know, lauding whatever came out of the government. Uh, they may have not been you know, devastating in some, like, like some of the social media here. Uh, but even that was also present. I think the Japanese colleagues said, uh, because the Japanese media are always more in line with what the government is saying, it seems reasonable. Uh, Taiwan had a, quite a bit of a very, um, a tr you know, uh, aggressive media coverage in the beginning. And, and then when it was really successful, of course, what are you gonna say? You know, everything gets better than in the <laughs> other country. So, you know, it's the same thing was said about Germany. And I think there was a misunderstanding with Andreas before, you know, if you have nothing to complain about, well, the media can only say what's happening, you know? Mm -hmm. and, and that was partially the case for these three uh, democratic countries. The media had hardly anything to complain because things went so well. 
Okay, so it's not really that the media have been more helpful, shall we say, in, in these countries, but simply that the handling of the crisis has been more competent and therefore the media actually had much less to criticize, which uh, sounds, of course, quite logical. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Anybody else who wants to chime in on this uh, particular scene? Uh, otherwise, there are a few more questions uh, that have come up. Uh, so there's a question for Nicholas actually here. So how do you feel about the recommendations by Ortwin for researchers to take a more active role in engaging with social media? How do you balance the more traditional demands on your academic life with engaging with something like Authentisci? Thank you. That's a very good question. Um, and, and personally, it's, it's taken about eight years for me to realize that I think I should do more uh, engaging with the public as a scientist. Um, I'm, I'm a neuroscientist and a research fellow now at Cardiff University, but um, I certainly didn't do enough um, public engagement. And, and perhaps it's not for, for, for everyone. Um, and, and certainly everybody doesn't need to be active on social media if it's not of their interest. But some very simple things that people can do in this context that helps a lot is to uh, read the press releases that are released by your own institution, because it's often the case that those press releases are um, taken forwards by the more mainstream media and perhaps not edited or, or, or checked carefully for the original material. Um, now, in terms of um, balancing it with my more traditional activities, um, the there's it was very worthwhile. This has been a very rewarding project, but the but it is extremely difficult to um, to get something like this set up, and and it is particularly difficult if, unless it's unless it's unless it's profitable. When it's not proper profitable, and Authenticize is aiming to be a, a non profit organization, uh, to set up something with in institutional members um, without the sort of legal expertise is is perhaps um, far more difficult than uh, than it should be, considering the amount of benefit it could have. Okay, I think Eva Maria uh, wanted to say something. Actually, uh, no, I didn't. I didn't signal, but now as as I as I get the chance. So the uh, the um, the piece uh, that really spoke to me as as a scientist, and I'm a I'm a pure mathematician by training, and probably so that's that's a bit of a hard hard subject to put put forward to the to the general public. But uh, I. Your, 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 your expression for a need of a better narrative was, was speaking to me quite a bit. And I think there is a lot to be learned, a lot to be done also in terms of what do we pass on to students? I mean, how much of critical reading do we actually teach them when we teach our general classes? Or are we really teaching subject matter and stop short after that? I mean, especially in the natural sciences, right? I mean, is it, is it the, the integral we solve or do we, do we explain to them also to interpret that and to think further and, and to think beyond the, uh, the technical solution? So that, that, that really spoke to me as a bit of a personal note at this point. I think that's a very good point, uh, that there is obviously a general issue of, of education behind all of these things. I mean, clearly misinformation of the most grotesque nature, and we have heard some examples of that already, uh, could not be spread by people who have some basic knowledge of, uh, uh, of, of, of science, for example. So clearly there's an educational issue. There's also a more specific question that relates perhaps a bit uh, to this that has just come in from Konstantinos Mauro, who says, could critical media literacy be the solution to fake news? Is it enough? Should critical media literacy be included as a taught subject in high schools? And if so, how would one actually uh, teach that? I don't know whether anybody has uh, good ideas about this. Well, I could, uh, make, Audrey, yeah. Yeah, I could make a start on this one. I mean, I think we'll never be able to have a, a subject that can really tell what's true and what's not true. I mean, all the literacy that we have in school have that kind of uh, 
a program in the back that if you learn mathematics, physics, or whatever, that you have some tools in order to make those to kind of distinction. But I think what would be good, it's two things that I think we should actually add to school is one is that we get people better prepared for probability theory and stochastic theory, because that has become such a major element of science. And most of the science class today is basically deterministic. It's either true or not true. Now, we have so many things now that we do also in physics and chemistry, uh, you know, where we have, you know, probabilistic statements and that sometimes people are just not understanding, you know, the impact of that. And the second point is what I also try to do with myself is to say, we need to train people how they perceive things. Uh, so this is much more of a, a training in psychology of oneself. Uh, so why are we so eager to believe in things that are simply absurd uh, and what makes them so attractive. Uh, and uh, you know, what are the processes in which nudging actually takes place? And, and I think if people are just being more, let's say vaccinated against fake news in a way that they understand their own mechanisms, I think that's much more effective than saying this is true and this is not true because the next time they get to it, then you know, it's all again a, a very different topic. So those are my two things that I would add uh, that we really need to include in the educational program. Yeah, I think those are very good points actually, Audrey. That's uh, exactly what is, what is needed. Uh, in terms of sort of media literacy, uh, Nicholas, do you have any comments on, on, on that question? Um, I, don't, I don't think so, I'm afraid. Uh, um, okay. it's, it's, it's useful that, that our tool is, um, is something that people could can use in this context, I suppose. It has, has relevance here, but it's certainly not something that uh, has enough relevance yet to be included in the curriculum. Okay. Uh, I see another question has just now come in. Let's see what it is. So this is to all panelists. What strategies should democratic societies employ to counter misinformation and disinformation while avoiding the risk of closing down public discourse as a result? So this is a little bit overlapping, I guess, with the points that we have uh, already made. And so a little bit harking back to the point I was trying to make about whether sometimes the media actually in their quest to be sort of critical nevertheless are doing actually damage in, in, in some cases. And what, but this is specifically to counter misinformation. So what can, because there is misinformation not only in the sort of more dark uh, uh, parts of the social media. But even I would say from a person who is just a lay person in this context, reading newspapers, even the so-called quality newspapers I have noticed are often given prominence to what I would say are rather spurious uh, forms of not necessarily fake news as such, but the way they highlight certain issues that are not very important very often uh, highlight particularly quotes from questionable politicians, which they give enormous prominence to, in spite of the fact that these politicians actually don't know what they are talking about, shows me that not even quality newspapers are necessarily always playing a particularly either helpful or, or correct role. Yeah, Andreas? Maybe I'll start. I think the crucial point is really to make a distinction, first of all, between false news even in a big newspaper there can be wrong news yeah this is something different than fake news so fake news means intentionally building up a strategy to communicate something and it's that's something completely different and uh, coming back to the more general question uh, uh, we got uh, i think it was by, by david what i what i really think is that uh, what societies can do is to estimate and also financially the costs of journalism. So it's not for free. It's cost something. And many media outlets had 
on the one hand on their own problems to move to the digital, but on the other hand, they have really problems that everybody expects media coverage for free in these times of social media and platforms. And that's not the case. Uh, to do good coverage, uh, people have to work hard. It costs time and it costs money. And if you look around Europe, uh, one problem we have in many, many societies in many countries is uh, that the original system, how uh, media can make the necessary money, and this is by advertisement, does not work anymore. Because advertisement goes to the big tech, tech companies in Silicon Valley, mainly to Facebook and Google when it comes to the digital. And what, for example, local region, regional newspapers can get is very, very limited. And this is the reason why they are shrinking down. Uh, so we have across Europe in many countries, some of the large national outlets, which work quite well. We have the public media, which work quite well because they have a sustainable model. And beside them, uh, many, many other kinds of media outlets go uh, come into pressure. And I think from my point of view, this is really one of the fundamental problems we have with our hybrid media system in these days. And we must think about um, developing new kinds of models um, to, to have a critical, sustainable uh, journalism. Yeah, I think that's an important point, Karin. Well, I would just strongly agree with Andreas here. I think that we have to recognize that um, responsible journalism is a key good essential to the health of a democratic society and really is, is probably our main defense against uh, misinformation and other harmless or harmful uh, forms of information circulating. And so what that means is that we have to think about uh, responsible journalism, so uh, uh, really uh, well-established media organizations as being part of the essential infrastructure of a society. And that necessitates financial support in the light of advertising revenue and other forms of revenue falling away as Andreas has, has described. So for me, that is a key part of the puzzle of how to combat fake news is by supporting real news. Okay, thank you uh, very much. There's an, maybe this will be sort of one of the final questions or perhaps the final question. So somebody is complaining that there seems to be little factual news and much more opinion. And that very often there is not much done to ensure distinction between opinions and uh, actual uh, real uh, factual news and whether the panel agrees with that statement. I don't know whether anybody wants to make a comment on that. Uh, Otwin? Yeah, I mean, there are a whole set of empirical studies on that question, so it's not something that has not been really researched. And uh, it's not as, uh, let's say, strong as people might think. Um, so even in the former days when we had just newspapers, there were often uh, the distinction between opinion and news not very clearly demarcated. Um, it was always uh, the general journalist norm to do that. And it's still the norm of the, let's say, established media, specifically the press media. Um, however, what we can see in the social media is that this distinction seems to merge towards a more stronger advocacy line of news. So there are news of Greenpeace, news of the Employers Association, news of whoever. And uh, that they, of course, color it in a way that they believe serves their own interests and their own values. So we see this more than we had seen it before, because before, uh, prior to this time, I mean, we had newspapers that were run by, you know, professional journalists, and, and they had some kind of code of behavior and everything else. If the same news come from an interest group, which they always had in terms of press releases, but those were not released to everyone in the world. Now with the social media uh, exposure, they can do it directly. And I think that's a partially giving this extreme 
uh, you know, broad uh, uh, bandwagon width of uh, of opinions uh, that we can see in, in social media, uh, from the absurd to the very correct, and and that makes it so difficult to make the right selection because everyone is exposed, you know, to fake news as well as just uh, ignorance, uh, and also to to real good news. Um, but I would uh, doubt the idea that the conventional media, I think, have not changed that much. We see a lot stronger polarization in the United States, that's true. Uh, so that is also within the research. So Fox News and others that have been you know, very strongly uh, aligned to a specific line of thinking, uh, either you know, one hand side the liberal side, the other more to the conservative side. But we had that also in the classic media, maybe not as pronounced. But as I said, the investigations into this show that we always had that problem Problem, even 20 or 30 years ago, it has been, you know, less pronounced in the social media, uh, but we still have that distinction in the classic established media. Okay, I will take now the last question, but uh, I think the last question is just worth having. Uh, so this is a person who addresses the question of algorithms. So uh, this person says algorithms used by global players like Google are playing an increasingly important role in selecting what information is considered most relevant to us. Search engines help us navigate massive databases of information. How do algorithms, for example, used by Google Scholar, are they also influencing the way of doing research in academia? So this is a kind of very broad question, which mixes maybe quite a few things. But uh, since we haven't sort of maybe very explicitly talked about the algorithms today, maybe it's a good point to end on if anybody has any uh, comments on, on, on that. Uh, yeah, I think Karen was first and then Andreas. Well, just very briefly, I think that it's a really important question because it uh, calls attention to the fact that algorithms are not neutral but that they're, they're uh, programmed in with particular biases and the fact that the workings of the algorithm tend to be invisible to us as audience members sort of hides the underlying politics and the ways in which the information is targeted or uh, tailored in particular ways. So I think it's a very important thing to pay attention to and it's something that cuts across all the different ways in which we interact with algorithms as we seek out information that ranges from Google Scholar to um, Amazon shopping um, to Facebook. So I think it's really essential to remember the fact that algorithms can never be understood as neutral and actually have a profound impact on what we're exposed to. Uh, Andreas? Yeah, but maybe as an add-on, I want to start first with a joke. <laughs> so okay, taking algorithms fine. from Google, there was the big hope with Google Trends, yeah, that uh, we could anticipate what is coming in the future. Google Trends was not able to anticipate what was coming with COVID-19. Ex post, we could use Google Trends to reconstruct some patterns but we could not predict the future. And I think this brings me to, to, to the crucial point I want to make. So on the one hand, algorithms are very much linked with imaginations, how we could build up a better AI world where anything would be possible and so on and so on and so on. And around COVID-19, uh, we experienced a lot of these kinds of imaginations. And in the end, the algorithms were not so much the big help in this crisis. On the other hand, of course, we have the problem with algorithms when it comes uh, to the presentation of news of online discourse. Uh, but what I think what is important is a more critical ambivalent position in between who does not understand algorithms as something which just would change the world on their own. It's always in the entanglement with human practices and more or less hybrid situations, hybrid figurations, when algorithms play a role. On their own, they just don't do anything. It's always together with humans. And I think this is the critical point of view we should take on questions like these. Okay, thank you very much. I think we are coming to, to the end of, of, of this webinar. And I just want, on behalf of Academia Europea, 
and the Cardiff Hub to thank all of you very much for what I think has been a very interactive webinar with lots of interesting points and much to think about. Uh, and for a lay person like me in this uh, media journalism world, it has certainly been uh, very interesting indeed. And thank you also to our audience for having uh, stayed with us for th this webinar. And I think it's been a nice uh, event uh, that Brightman and Cardiff could join in, in, in this way. And from Cardiff University, I would have a special thanks to Eva Maria Feichner for having been here with us today. It, it, it was very nice. And finally, last but not least, uh, thanks to the team uh, in Cardiff who actually made the webinar happening, uh, Julia Davis and, and Phil Harris at uh, Cardiff University. They have done a lot of background work uh, and actually made it a physical reality. So thank you very much to everybody and uh, enjoy the rest of the day.